Tonight on Town Hall, are your children getting the education they deserve? A lot of parents are taking matters into their own hands. Fed up with education cutbacks and a lack of personal attention in the classroom, they're pulling their children out of public school. Is homeschooling a reasonable alternative during this education crisis? What about private schools? What's the best way for our children to get an education? Town Hall puts schools to the test, next. And now your moderator, Jeff Gianola. Good evening, everybody. A few weeks ago, Oregonians said no to a sales tax, money that was supposed to go to education. And since then, school districts across the state have had to slash their budgets with proposed cuts, millions of dollars. How are those cuts going to affect your children? And what about the future of Oregon? Also, with the cuts in public education, we're starting to see more and more parents put their kids in private schools. And what about home schools? Thousands of kids in Oregon are already staying at home, being taught by mom or dad or, or both. Those are the issues and concerns we'll look at on Town Hall tonight. And we have got a packed house because this is a very important issue. I want to share with you uh, some of the concerns from other parents who have these same concerns that you do. Here's reporter Mark Hess. Jill Jones has two children now at the private Catlin Gable School, where tuition runs about $9,000 a year per student. I don't know if it's just a perception or it's real, but um, class size is something that concerns me. And if I want my children to have uh, any kind of um, special relationship with a teacher, um, extra attention, um, then I don't believe I'm going to uh, have that in a public school at the moment. She is one of hundreds of families who are second-guessing Oregon's public school system and its future. At this moment, things are pretty st uh, stable, and they haven't seen any dramatic cutbacks. But when you have a child that's four or five years old, and you're looking at their whole um, future, um, they don't want to be in a program that's going to be a very different program than what they see today. Get a piece of paper out for your spelling words. The unexpected drop in enrollment in Portland will result in a $5 million loss in state aid and what the district says will be a handful of layoffs. Nothing dramatic, officials say, until you look at the big picture. We become less competitive. Parents pull their kids out for very good reasons, put them into private or parochial schools, move to another part of the state. Private schools may be out of reach for many families, even for those who see the public system in decline. Educators say the obvious answer is more money, but that flies in the face of another strongly held perception, one that says public schools have all the money they need. In Portland, Mark Hass, Channel 2 News. We have parents and educators and teachers here to talk about that issue tonight, and I first want to go to this man right here. Dan Rosenhaus, you pulled your son out of a public school and put him in a private school? That's right. What were the reasons behind that? Uh, some of the reasons were the same things that you just heard articulated in the tape that was shown. Uh, mainly, we were concerned that the quality of education we were getting in Portland Public Schools, which we thought was excellent and outstanding, wasn't going to survive uh, the budget cuts that were about to come. We just didn't think that they'd be able to maintain the, uh, the quality that we in part lived in Portland to get. So it was fear that drove you? Uh, it was, I don't know if I would call it fear, but I was certainly concerned that the quality of education wasn't going to be there. And I'd been serving as a volunteer with the Portland Public Schools on budget committees, and so maybe I knew it a little better than a lot of people did. I you just, were involved in the process. I was involved in the process, and I, it, it didn't seem to me that with the cuts that were, that were likely to happen, uh, resulting from Measure 5 that we would still have... Uh, well, quick question, is your son attention. liking uh, private school? He's, he's liking it. He's missing public school. He misses his friends and he misses uh, some of the things that he got in public school. But uh, he's an adaptable kid and he's a bright kid. He's, he's doing well. We're going to meet another Dan sitting on this side of you right here. And this is uh, Dan Calzaretta. And what is it that you did, Dan, because you didn't like public schools. What did you do? Well, it wasn't so much not liking public school because my work in public school was some of the most rewarding and worthwhile work I'd ever done. What did you do for public school? I was a teacher at Westland High School in social studies for two and a half years. Um, and working with the kids was great. But what I saw was that um, 
some kids just weren't having their needs met and I wanted to start a school which I did with five four other teachers um, that would allow kids to have an individualized curriculum that would allow them to uh, express themselves creatively to to do the things that maybe they weren't able to do in whatever school they came from so you thought public school the way the system was set up was maybe a little limiting for some students for some kids it is yeah what do you think about public education overall how do you mean well in the sense that you said for some kids, but do you mm -hmm. think for the majority it works? I don't know. My experience at, at uh, the high school was that maybe for 30, 40 percent of the kids, it was exactly what they needed. Uh, for maybe another 20 or 30 percent, it was about what they needed. And then for the rest, it r wasn't what they needed. Let's go to a familiar face, and I'm going to walk to this side of the room. Jack Beerworth, who heads up Portland Public Schools. You've been a guest on Town Hall a few times now, Jack. Are these concerns that you just heard, are they legitimate concerns? Absolutely. Um, we will lose $75 million over the next couple of years. That will raise class sizes to the high, to the mid to high 20s next year and to the high 30s the year after that. And that's not as good an education as kids have been getting. You talked about money, and we have a chart here, Jack, that I want to show you. These are your proposed cuts. Nothing's finalized yet, but these are your proposed cuts. And let's take a look at that chart. Why don't you explain that to us a little bit? What are we looking at, and what are those dollar figures exactly? 1992-93, the Portland Public Schools had a budget of $355 million. By 1995-96, at the best, we will have a budget of about $253 million, uh, down $100 million. And you say we, one, of, one of the biggest effects that we'll see are classroom sizes. We'll see an increase in classroom size. Yes, but I want to say that the first round of cuts we kept entirely away from kids because that's my value, the same as these two uh, gentlemen said. Uh, we did not raise, we cut $42 million this past year, and we did not raise class size at all. We did not cut any classroom teachers. And that's the way I think it should be. But the problem is we're going to have to cut $100 million. And then we're going to see increase in class size. Yes and we're going to see cuts in programs. And we're not going to be able to offer the kind of education that we've offered in the past. We'll do the best we can with what we've got. And frankly, I came because I thought this state was ready to move forward. And public schools are doing a good job, but they need to do a lot better. Our kids are not doing as well in this country as they need to do. I'm going to go to the man next to you. Uh, introduce yourself. Bob Everhart, <coughs> excuse me, I'm Dean of Education at Portland State. We talked about class size here. Right. Um, Jack says class sizes are going to get a lot larger in schools as these budgets are cut. What is a normal class size? Where is the danger zone with the kids in a, in a classroom? At what level? How big yeah. is too big? That's a good question because there's a lot of mythology about this issue. Um, I've done some analysis in the last couple months on this class size issue and it's clear despite the conventional wisdom that there is a direct relationship between class size and academic achievement. What seems to be the threshold is around uh, 22 to 25 students where that the decline in achievement declines a little less rapidly for the average student. In other words, um, once you get about 25, teachers are teaching the class pretty much in the same way as they would if they have 35 or 40. It's basically a large group setting. The problem, though, is, and I think this gentleman from, from West Lynn put his finger on it, the problem is that that effect treats different kids differently. For the average student or the superior student, the larger class size is probably not going to affect them as, as um, cataclysm cataclysmically as it will for kids in the lower 20, 30 percentiles. Those are the kids who are going to get hurt most because they need the most individual attention. Okay, parents are listening to this and some parents are saying that's why I'm either going to homeschool my kids because of this class size issue or I'm going to send them to private school. And I've got to ask the question, what's wrong if I'm a parent and I have the money and I have the funds and maybe I'm going to take on another job so I could send my kid to a private school. What's wrong with sending my child to a private school or teaching him at home? Norma Paulus, head of education here in Oregon. I'll pose that question to you. Well, first of all, I have protected and, um, and will always protect the right of people to send their children to private schools and to homeschool. And these parents that are homeschooling, they do a wonderful job. So there isn't any argument about that. But I would suggest to you that society as a whole um, needs a good public uh, educational system. I think and I believe this passionately, that the whole democratic process in this country 
springs from a public school system where all kinds of children, rich and poor, and very bright and not so bright, and handicapped, and all kinds of races and colors, when they mix together on the public playground, that's what's given us this, this strength. I also believe that the public school system is what has been fueling the American dream. And we're going to see that again, particularly here on the West Coast. So we need to protect the institution of public education. And there are many things that we can do. We, it has to change. Jack Beerworth is right. And we are changing it. We, we're doing a good job for preparing kids for yesterday, but we're not doing a good job of preparing our children for tomorrow. And we're dedicated to that, and we have a blueprint for it. Let's hear from some of the parents who have maybe taken their kids out of public schools. Raise your hand, anyone here. Maybe you're teaching your kids at home or maybe a private school. Right here. Yes, you in the back, sir. Your name? Ed Marahart, parent of a 10-year-old that attends the Francisco Montessori Earth School. And myself and many families that have their children in Montessori education cannot get that in the public schools and we are being discriminated against. My child has attention deficit and has been tested by ESD. And ESD said that the best learning environment for him is an individualized Montessori, Montessori program. Something that a public school couldn't provide. That they can't provide and we're being discriminated against because I have to pay private school tuition. But Norma Paulus and the others say, no, we cannot have school choice mm -hmm. to offset that because we're paying twice for for schooling, for public school with our taxes, and then we pay again for private school We're tuition. We're going to touch on that issue a little later, Tony. You're talking about maybe a voucher system where you can have a choice to maybe go to a private. We're, we're, we will touch right. on that because that's a very important issue. I want to hear from this g gentleman right here. Yes. Yes, my name is Richard Burke. I'm the chairman of the Libertarian Party of Oregon. You know, a lot of people today value diversity. They say we need lots of different kinds of people, different sets of values. We need these things. And I think that this is not all bad. By having some kids go to private schools and some kids taught in home schools and others taught in public schools, we get that kind of diversity. If we try too hard to have this melting pot theory, we destroy the diversity that we're trying to create. So I think it should be easier to protect that diversity. You're saying a complete circle. I want to hear from someone here who, who, who's for homeschooling. Maybe your kids are being taught at home. Anyone here? Sir, you right there. What would you like me to say? Well, <laughs> give me your you, How many kids? We have four children. We've homeschooled for eight years. Both of you are the teachers? Uh, Debbie primarily does it while I'm working, but I help out in certain things. And your ages of your children? Three, eight, ten, and twelve. Okay. Now, I should just clear this up, and Norma Paulus will back <coughs> me up on that. There's certain things you have to do within state guidelines, uh, certain test stuff, to make sure that your kids are getting the proper education. And you're meeting certain guidelines, and you're willing to do that. Yes, we're, we test them every year through the state. But, but what is it that you feel you can offer them at home that they couldn't get in a public school? Well, I think there's, there's a couple issues. I think uh, we can offer them some values that uh, perhaps are not found in the public school system. There are certain things found in the public school system that we don't want to expose our children to. And uh, so it's a very good environment for us to educate our children. Do you think they're getting a better education at home? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. What about private school? Anyone here sending their child to a private school? Yes, you, ma'am, in the back. Wait till the microphone gets there so we can hear you. My name is Phil McKay, and my son Russell is attending Pacific um, Crest Community School this year, and we took him out of public school. I also have a son in public school. Portland Public Schools. And so you have one in private. And one in public. And one in public. Okay, you've got an interesting perspective on all this. What, what, uh, what do you think? I do, and I'm also a fifth year ed student at Portland State. So I do have a lot of different interests. And what it is that I feel is the strongest reason Russell was taken out is um, he's a unique learner, and I don't think the majority of the teachers he came in contact with could address that. And my other son is in a talented and gifted program, and I don't think his needs are being addressed. Okay. And so, I, I'm dying to get into the public system and try things out. Good. Well, Norma Paulus, <laughs> let, 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 what do you say to that? Well, um, I worry also about our talented and gifted, and my husband and I helped start the very first talented and gifted program in the state of Oregon, and I feel very strongly about it. And uh, there are a lot of school boards that don't feel that strongly about it, and they have given it short shrift through the budget process. And so uh, I welcome you into the public school system. What we're trying to do with the school reform effort, ha however, which we are now in going into the third year of, 
is to use the talented and gifted curriculum and level of uh, standards as the norm to raise the expectations for all children and to use talented and gifted uh, teachers uh, in that staff retraining effort to internally raise the expectations. Uh, so we are trying, but I think uh, your guest here is right that most talented and gifted programs in the state of Oregon are not as good as they should be, and, and many of our gifted children are falling through the cracks, okay, and you, that's you, a tragedy. You touch on a point. Can we get a quality education in public schools here in Oregon, the way, yes. the way it's set up? Can yes, we? Yes, we're doing it. Sir? Yes. My son is uh, in the second grade at Buckman Elementary School, and he's getting a great education. Uh, yes, there are problems, as there are problems with any situation, but uh, I would invite everybody to come to the halls, as I have been in the halls with the teachers and the children. You'll find excitement. Uh, in the classroom, you'll find rapt attention. Uh, you'll see kids who are receiving what, what we call a magnet education for each and every child that goes to Buckman. The quality is high. Uh, we would like to see it better. The teachers, the uh, certainly the superintendent, uh, uh, and the, and the uh, uh, parents. Uh, and we'll work hard to do that. You say public education for your children works yes. at your particular school. Anyone else agree yes. with that? I want to hear from a young person here. Your name? I'm a junior at Lincoln High School. My name is Blake Axelrod. And I feel that at the moment I'm getting very good education, um, the, especially with Lincoln's International Baccalaureate program. Um, I mean, it's an international program. I feel it gives a great perspective and um, puts you at a high level if it can be kept around. Well, this is, I was just going to say that. <laughs> I hear Jack Beerwurst over here. You almost have tears in your eyes, practically. You're saying, here's a kid who's just doing great, but you're saying something like that might not be around. It may not be, or uh, it may also be a situation where he's going to be sitting in a class that's going to be as demanding as any in the world and he's gonna be sitting there with 40 other students. And it's unfair to put him in a class to try to achieve at that level with 40 other kids. So if we maintain it, we may be in that kind of situation. That is exactly the kind of program that we need to expand across the state and across the country. We have got kids who are going through that who are fully competitive with the best in the world. Mm -hmm. And they are setting themselves to that standard. There's no wishy-washy, it can't be, it can't be uh, dumbed down. These are kids that are achieving at a level that is an international standard, and okay. they've got to pass. Okay, we're going to take a break here. We talked a little bit about private schools. Maybe you have some children in private school. Maybe you know some friends who do, and you always hear this. Are, are your children missing out on something because they're not going to private school? We're going to compare public and private schools and open up the discussion on Town Hall, and we continue. Stay with us. Pacific Care, the health and wellness plan for people aged 0 to 64. <laughs> Secure Horizons, the health and wellness plan for people with Medicare and those aged 65 and over. Because the best reasons for staying healthy are the things you'd miss if you weren't. Pacific Care and Secure Horizons. We know the value of keeping you healthy. Sports Extra, Student Athletes of the Month, Student Athlete of the Year, full coverage of girls and boys high school basketball finals and high school football championships. 
When it comes to showcasing high school sports, no one plays the game better than Lou Gallos and the Channel 2 News sports team. Watch for highlights of your favorite team tonight. We've got the spirit. Sunday on Town Hall. This is a show about me and what I think. Rush Limbaugh, what is it about this guy? He's just really a fun, lovable guy. He's an idiot. Town Hall pits ditto heads against liberals. Is Rush right? Call 2314620 to join the Town Hall debate. More than 90% of Oregon students attend public schools. Ninety percent attend public schools. Still, ten percent—a a big, a big margin—don't. They either are at home learning, homeschool, or private school. And I want you to meet a family right here that has taken the private school route. And let me scoot right in here. And your name, first of all, Jane Campbell. And your name, Elizabeth Campbell. You're Jane's daughter. I would say. And what school do you go to? The, Fr the French American School. Okay. How long have you been going there for? Um, since Mom. she was two and a half, she's now in fifth grade. Okay, why did you choose to go to a private school? It was not a choice of private versus public. We were very much interested in bilingual education. Okay. At the time that our oldest child started school, the French American School was the only bilingual program around. It's still the only total immersion bilingual program around. Our eldest daughter is now at West Sylvan Middle School. Elizabeth will also go to public school. So when you're she just in... We're going the opposite direction. So here. you start off in a private school going to public school because in the early years, you're learning another language. You're learning French. Could you speak a little French to me? Um, what do you want me to say? Well, <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, say anything you want, and then tell me what you said, because I only know Italian. Okay. <laughs> Bonjour, je m'appelle Elisabeth Combel, et je suis très enchantée d'être là. Merci. What did you say? Okay, I said, hello, my name's Elizabeth Campbell, and I'm very delighted to be here. Oh, well, we're delighted to have you. We saw... Very interesting here, uh, folks, because they're starting in a private school and then going to a public school. Who wants to comment on that? Anyone else have a similar experience? Yes, you, ma'am, right there. You, yes. Right. Hello. <laughs> I'm Kyle Fuchs, and my daughter is currently attending Chapman Elementary School, and we started out in Catlin Gable. And there are definitely differences between the two schools, especially in enrichment activities. There's much more enrichment in terms of language and art and music in, in the private school. However, the public school has a lot more to offer, I feel, in terms of the kind of kids she's interacting with. There was virtually no diversity in Catlin Gable whatsoever. Oh. People were from similar economic, socioeconomic status and very little ethnic diversity. So you're saying school is more than just what you're learning in the classroom. That's it's right. The children and you're I, attending I with. I feel and... that, I mean, my kid was in second grade last year. She learned to use the library. She did a research report in great depth on gorillas. She made landmark strides in reading, went from simple books to chapter books. And although the class size is larger, I still feel she's getting as good an education as she could get. Let, in let me meet your daughter right there, because I always hate to talk about people with that. Hi, what's your name? Laura okay. Fuchs. Uh, Laura, and how are you doing in school? Fine. Okay. Uh, how old are you? Eight. Okay, I've got an eight-year-old too. Very, very nice. We talk about diversity a little bit in the classroom, and you had your hand up, sir, and uh, address that issue for us and tell us your name. I'm Rod Taylor. I'm from Dallas. Uh, I've taught for about 20 years. I'm not teaching now because I've got to get certified in the state of Oregon, which is a difficult process. You're from Dallas, you're from yeah. Dallas, Texas, no, originally? Dallas, Dallas Oregon, Oregon. Okay. Yeah, but originally from Kansas okay. by way of Southern California. Um, <laughs> I should have come directly here on the wagon train. <laughs> but um, Mandisa, my daughter here, was homeschooled last semester, and this semester I put her back in public school. Now, the reason for that, and she sort of went kicking and screaming at first, but now she's there, and you can ask her whether or not she likes it. But the reason for that was the first semester of last year, I determined that she learned nothing. Now, I can do that because I'm a teacher. My wife is also a teacher. This is when it. you were at home? Yeah, back in Southern California. Okay, she learned nothing. 
What kind of school? The semester. What kind of school? It was, a, it was a public school. Oh, public school. Right. Okay. okay. And so we homeschooled her and then this year put her back in public school. Now, part of the reason why I did that is because the final question, not the final answer, but the final question is public school. I don't care what I do with her at home or what happens in a private school. The question is, can she make it in a public school? Because this is not a private world. This is a public world. And the question is, can they make it once they leave school? And the chances are she's going to be better prepared to do that once she goes to public school. Now, this is an interesting situation for us because the school she's at, there's 525 kids, and she is the only black kid there. But when she leaves school, she's going to, into a situation, because I've been in a number of them, where, where I'm the, the only, only black person there. Especially the in a state is, like Oregon, where we don't, we don't have the And the question is, that. can you function? Well, if you, whether or not you can function depends on what your education is and that includes more than just reading and writing and what was that like for you to go from homeschooling where you're a little protected right yeah. you could kind of go to the bathroom when you wanted to right or yeah. get something to eat when you wanted to and now uh now you're you're stuck in a situation where you're back in uh public school have you adjusted to it mm, yeah and, and do you like it mm -hmm. If you had to do it all over again, do you wish your, your dad would have just kept you at home, or are you glad he made that decision? I'm glad he made the decision. And how do you feel, your father said at a big school like that, being the only black person? Well, I'm not really. There's a couple other kids, but... But still, in, in, in the minority, minority, how is that? Not really. Different. So you've adjusted fine. Yeah. Okay. And that was the key. See, that was the question I had. Will she adjust to whatever situation, whether it's 40 kids in a classroom or she's got to perform at a certain level? It doesn't make any difference. The question is, can she make it in that situation? Okay, let's now go to well, can. let's go to the opposite. Who says though that a private school is still a best way to go for an education? You. Well, I don't necessarily think that private school is the only way to do it, but public schools the way they are right now are not offering what private schools can offer because we've heard a lot of people say you need individualized attention, you need smaller class sizes to really educate kids. And in a private school, you can do that. In the private school where I teach, Cascade Valley School, every student gets individualized attention because we don't have classes already set up. Every student is involved in an individualized learning program. There's staff to work with each student individually. And we're doing it for about half the cost per pupil that Portland Public Schools is doing it. Sir, you? Yes, uh, if the quality of the public schools is so good, why do 40% of the urban school teachers, public school teachers... That's not true. Your <laughs> Geiger, <laughs> Geiger <laughs> did that Just on tele second. television. In a, make, in a, make your point. Uh, uh, Keith Geiger, president of the National Education Association, admitted that 40% of the urban public school teachers send their children to private schools. Okay, let's get and introduce who you are, My sir, so people know who you are. My name is Bruce Adams. I'm a teacher on leave from the Beaverton School District, and I'm president of the Oregon Education Association. I'm sorry I blurted out, sir, and interrupted no, you. No, that's it's, fine. That's it's what just town a, hall's about. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> it's just that I've heard that statement so much, and I've heard from Keith Geiger that it's absolutely not true. Keith Geiger is the president of the National Education Association. I was at a meeting with him two weeks ago, and somehow or other that seems to be an urban legend. Our studies show that public school teachers have their schools in private school in about the same proportion as the average population. In the very large cities, that's not as true. But overall, it, it's pretty much the same as the average population. I can't speak about the rest of the country, but in, in Oregon, that certainly is the case. And the average in, uh, nationwide for uh, homeschooling or private schools is 14%. Oregon's percentage is only 7 So we've always had a strong commitment to public education in the state. And our teachers um, and their children do, too. I don't know about other states, but that's not true in Oregon. Okay. Do we get a better education in private schools or a better education in public schools? And let's uh, let's take a look at, at a chart right here. These are SAT scores. And can everyone see these? I want everyone to take a look at these. Public versus non-public. And look at that. They're almost even the whole way. Now, I don't know if that's the best way to gauge because there's other reasons you send your children to different schools. But strictly from SAT scores, you can see that it's pretty evenly matched, public and private. Some, some interesting statistics there. I'm going to go back to our education professor, 
uh, for a second. What, what would you make of that, public versus private, and those SAT scores? Well, I think that, that what's happening here is, uh, is what happens when you look at American students, for example, compared to, to students in other countries. If you look at, for example, American students compared with Japanese students, you look at the top 20% of American students on international tests, those students do better than the top 20% of Japanese students. Hmm. If you look at the top 50% of American students, they do as well as Japanese students do on international tests. What happens to these averages, and this is, I think, what's happening in public and private schools, is what's, what's going on in the lower 50%. There where, is where we have the problem. The, the thing about private schools is they have the ability to take the best. They have the ability to what's called in the trade cream take the very best. Now, I don't see anything necessarily wrong with that if I was run, running a private school, but I think it's something that's very important to look at when you start comparing public and private schools. Are the student bodies the same? Okay. We've talked about private schools. Uh, when we come back here on Town Hall, we're going to talk more about homeschool. We touched on it a little bit, where you, the parent, are the teacher. The kids don't go off on the school bus. They stay right there in the kitchen, and you teach them all day. We'll talk more about homeschooling when Town Hall continues. I'd like a steak for dinner. <laughs> so would I. You know, maybe I'd like some seafood. Yeah, would you make up your mind? Sizzler's introducing Build Your Own Platter. Eight great items to pick from. At lunch, choose one like grilled chicken for $3.99. For dinner, choose any two like steak and shrimp for $5.99. Or choose any three and build your own huge platter for $7.99. I'll have the steak and scallops. I'll have the salmon and shrimp. <laughs> Me too. Would you make up your mind? George Smith Warehouse Sales, your direct connection. It's George's Christmas gift sale with incredible markdowns on top brand products and appliances, home electronics, and furniture. Come in and get fantastic Christmas savings on everything in stock. This holiday season, more people will trust Napa to keep their vehicles running and to help them save, too. Get this Napa toy truck with real truck sounds, just $16.99. 1994 Chilton repair manuals are a low $13.99 each. And get a 61-piece Evercraft tool set for only $29.99. So drive by or fly by your nearest Napa Auto Parts store today. We keep America running. We keep America running. To get the most efficient gas furnace you can buy, call day and night to the rescue. And right now, with the purchase of a high-efficiency gas furnace, we'll pay your highest month's gas bill. Call Stevens Heating, 754-1681, and find out how you can receive free gas. Call day and night and rescue me, rescue me. I'm in the middle. What am I supposed to do? What would you do if your children hated the man you wanted to marry? I love him. I love them. Should I give up Jan? Should I give up my children? On the next Sally. Monday at 4 on KATU Channel 2. Well, there's a cost comparison, and some folks will debate those exact numbers, but that's a look at uh, homeschooling versus public schooling, and you can see that homeschooling quite a bit cheaper. I, I want to show you something. This is a videotape of some kids learning at home, and these kids are the NOP children, and I think we're going to show a picture of them working on a computer. That's at home. They're homeschooled children. All four NOPs have been homeschooled by their parents who teach them math, history, and everything, I guess. Are they learning? Do they enjoy it? Well, look who's with us right now. We have two of the NOP children, and I want you to introduce yourselves. I'll start with you. I'm Brian Knopp. Hi, Brian. I'm Michelle. Brian, how old are you now? Fifteen. Okay, and you've been homeschooled since you were, yep. what, kindergarten, first grade? Since ever. <laughs> and what about you? I'm in seventh grade, I'm 12, and I've been homeschooled all through my schooling. What's that like? Because a lot of kids watching this, and even parents will say, boy, you guys have missed out on a lot of the kids in the classroom and walking down the hallway at school and things like that. Do you feel like you have? No, I don't. I think the only thing I've missed are the bad things. <laughs> <laughs> violence and <laughs> what about you I don't think I've missed any of it I get to spend lots of time with my friends and I'd rather stay with my brothers and sisters okay now you have to take regular tests and things like that yes. right yes for mrs. Paulus over there right <laughs> 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 to make sure that you're hitting the right thing but you in your particular case you enjoyed it yes 
Okay. And you didn't miss out on extracurricular activities at school. In a lot of ways, I'm saying you maybe don't know what you did miss. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. What do you think about that? I feel fine if I've missed something. I don't really care. I think I've gotten enough. I don't feel like I've been deprived from anything. Okay. And your mom's a good teacher? Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to introduce your father because he's the man you, you see on town hall who holds a microphone. <laughs> and I'm going to hold it this time. You're going to use your own microphone? I'm going to use my own microphone. This is Ron Knopf. And Ron, I want to get serious here for a minute. You have four kids that you've taught at home. And you heard the question I asked him. Yeah. Are you concerned that, that maybe you're protecting them a little too much, that it's sort of a, a false world you're bringing them up in? We heard the gentleman mm -hmm. here say they're going to be out in the real world. That's right, they are. So how do you feel okay, about that? Um, maybe to help a little bit with the, Brian and Michelle especially, uh, their extracurricular activity, Brian takes private violin lessons. He's also taken piano. Brian is also helping another uh, young woman teach a class of seven beginner violins mm -hmm. at another school, so he's involved in learning how to teach. He also has two private piano students, so he's learning those trades also and, and making an income. He has a desire to drive my car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, so you're he, making sure that they're doing other yeah, things. Yeah, they are doing. Michelle's in ballet. She's been in Metro Dance and has done things down at, uh, inter at the, uh, um, the theater down there. So you're very yeah. aware that they should be in yeah. other things they, as well with They other are. Kids. Our family is kind of, kind of arts-oriented. Now, your idea of protection, the, the best illustration I can give that is, is um, uh, us particular unique human beings takes a while for us to grow up. Uh, I use the illustration of a uh, hothouse plant. When you put it in a hothouse, you give it seed and it's a little sprout and you grow it and you, and you, and you nurture it and that's going to get so high. Then you start exposing it to the outside elements. When it's small, you don't expose it to the harsh elements, you use you softer elements first. Then you bring it back in. And as the plant grows, you expose it more and more and more until the plant is strong enough that it will survive on its own when it does get out. And, and along with the academics, we're also very concerned about those character qualities, which we've been having some problems which is in the a, public. Which is a common theme, right. I think, with a lot of uh, parents who mm -hmm. homeschool. Mom, raise your hand there. There's a teacher. <laughs> and I'll just, your name? Aletha Knott. Yeah, I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear now, thank you very much. I, I want to hear now from, uh, you can hold the microphone like your dad. I want to hear now from some parents or people who've maybe had their kids in home school and decided it wasn't maybe for them or such a good idea. You, sir, right there. Your name? Mike Shearer. Mike, what was your <clears throat> particular uh, situation? Uh, I was homeschooled for eight years. You uh, yourself were homeschooled? Yes. What ages were you? <clears throat> I started homeschool after second grade, which would be seven, I guess. And um, I spent eight more years in homeschool. Um, the, the thing that concerns me the most about homeschooling is that I found over the years, each additional year, I, I got a better dose of it, that I was missing out on a lot of enjoyment in life because I was isolated from my peers and living in the country and didn't have access to peers uh, for days at a time. Now, that was only for four years. The other half, we lived in neighborhoods and so forth, but I still didn't have access to peers much and had very little socialization until the seventh and eighth year when I got a motorcycle and a car. Did, did, were your parents, <laughs> were your parents as, uh, as, Ron makes a very good point of trying to involve his kids in other extracurricular activities. Did your parents do that at all for you? Or? Uh, my parents were very anxious to keep me away from the world, the evil influences of peers, uh, except for the few peers that uh, happened to be the children that, of the friends they had. But um, my point is that over that period of time, I discovered a lot of things about homeschool and there's, there seems to be two kinds of adults in this world today. If you haven't had an experience to relate to what isolation and homeschool is, you can't see it. You can't feel it. You can't touch it. You can't know what it is from your own experience. All you can do is believe somebody else. And, and uh, the problem with the homeschool movement is that... Um, well, you talk about the homeschool movement. I'm going to go to an expert on that right now and tell the folks who you are. My name is Brian Ray. I'm a professor at Western Baptist College, and I do research on homeschooling, National Home Education Research Institute. Okay, you heard some of the concerns right. here about being yeah. isolated yeah. if yeah. you're at home. Yeah. Well, one of the common questions that comes up is, what about socialization? Right. That's one of the main things. For several years, people were asking, well, can they learn? And several studies were done and found out that on the average, homeschooled children were scoring on nationalized, you know, standardized achievement tests at 65th to 80th percentile when the national average is 50. And so that question kind of died down. Now the question is, what about socialization? If you're a homeschooling parent, you've heard it more than a dozen times and you 
you sometimes get tired of it. Several studies have been done on socialization, social and emotional adjustment. And Mr. Shearer refers to his experience, and, and I don't deny that he had an experience, but on the average, in studies across the country, when we look at self-concept, when we look at uh, emotional development, you know, based on psychological tests, in all of these studies, the homeschooled children have done equal to or better than those in conventional schools. Self-concept has been significantly higher in these students. Uh, social adjustment, they've said that the children are similar in some ways to those in conventional private schools. However, they're less peer dependent, which is exactly the goal of many parents because the parents say, we're not raising our children to be peer oriented, we're raising them to be mature adults. That's the main point for a lot of homeschoolers. Okay, I hear one common theme with everyone here, and no matter if you're homeschooling or private schooling or, or public schooling, everyone here wants their children to have a quality education. That's right. No one here is arguing that point. And so it comes up, how do we get a quality education? Including this voucher system idea that we talked about earlier in the show, we'll explore that easier. If I gave you some money, $2,500, how would you use it? At a private school or a public school? Or would you just keep them at home and use it to buy the supplies at home? We'll look at that when Town Hall continues. I come to Euros Euros for the freshness and the quality. Food is healthy, the surface is good. It's a nice change from burgers and fries. My body is really important to me, and I come to Euros Euros for their food because it's really good for me, and I know it's always fresh. Nice, easy place to go and get something quick, but know that you're eating something that is going to be good for you. I come to Euros Euros for the healthy food and the fast service with a smile. Euros Euros at Clackamas Town Center, Portland's most popular mall. Behind this door is something you've never seen. Behind this door is a spectacle of sight and sound and sensation that you must experience to leave. Behind this door is the family room of the 21st century. But this door opens to just one place, Smith's Home Furnishings. Smith's Home Theater. Have you seen it? You know, I run into people all the time that have never shopped at a men's warehouse store, and I say the same thing to everybody. We offer many of the same brands, the same designers as you'll find in apartment stores at 20 to 30% less every day. Give us one minute. Just come into our store and look at the labels and look at the prices for 60 seconds, and you'll become a men's warehouse customer. I guarantee it. In Salem, Clackamas, Beaverton, and downtown Portland. Remember when you ate all the eggs you wanted? Well, you don't anymore, so every egg you do eat should be special. Introducing Eggland's Best, special eggs from specially fed hens. Eggs from hens that eat no animal fat. Eggs that are higher in nutrition than ordinary eggs because they have more vitamin E, an important antioxidant. Now you can make every egg you eat extraordinary. Eggland's Best, because our hens eat better, you'll eat better. Coming up tonight at 11, the shaking has stopped, but residents in southern Oregon are still rattled by yesterday's quake. We'll see how people are coping. The family of Polly Class and hundreds of volunteers who searched for her are coming together to say their goodbyes to the little girl. And it's singles life in the 90s. After discos, after singles clubs, there's always a chance to meet that special someone when you belly up to the book bar tonight at 11. quote there. Um, I want to show you something. This is Forbes magazine from uh, this June, this last June. And there's an article here called Suffer the Little Children, How the National Education Association Corrupts Our Public Schools. The author, Leslie Spencer, who's associated, associate editor of Forbes magazine, is in our audience tonight. She co-authored this. And Leslie, I guess what you're saying in here is that teachers, teachers unions are to blame a little bit for the uh, lack of quality in education these days. We certainly found doing that research that there was a very close correlation between the decline in quality of education in terms of all sorts of indicators, SAT scores, achievement scores, and the power of the unions which have, which have gone up since the war in, in, immeasurably. So you can really see the correlation in those two things and it's just a very interesting um, uh, thing to point out. Um, and if you look at the kinds of things that the union, unions are interested in bargaining, you'll, you'll see that for instance they hate merit pay or good teachers are paid more than bad teachers. They make it very, very hard to fire bad teachers. There are all sorts of 
structural things in the aims of the union that make it very, very hard for the kind of flexibility that you need to really work on quality education. Let's That's go to the head about. man here with the union. What do, you, what do you make of that? Well, as I understand it, she's making the point that's made in that article that uh, ever since 1950 or so, six, 60 or 70, uh, at some point in time, SAT scores have gone down and the power of the unions have gone up. Of course, that's the same point in time where we had more television, more drugs, more divorce, uh, any number of things have happened in our community since uh, during that same time. And I don't think that this is all up to the teachers. But what about that one specific charge that the whole merit pay, that the better teachers maybe should get a little bit more money instead of the tenure system? Well, I don't look at that as a charge. I look at that as an idea. Uh, is it a good idea? We're, no, we're concerned about that idea, frankly, because we think it's hard, it's difficult to evaluate which teachers are doing the best. A lot of the schemes that have come up to do that would penalize a teacher for having difficult students in their class. And we just don't think that, it, that it's been proven anywhere where it's been tried that it works. Okay, what, what, we talked about that a little bit. What else comes into quality education? you have any more thoughts on that, Leslie? Well, I do find that whenever this subject comes up, among people who are trying to defend the kinds of interests that the unions have. There is always this charge that it's impossible to test results of students or teachers. You can't tell the difference between a good teacher and a bad teacher. You can't really tell whether kids are doing well or not well. And after all, there are all these other factors that get in the way and there are social problems. And so, of course, and of course there are social problems. There are other reasons why the performance of education has declined. But the unions have interests which often directly conflict with quality and flexibility of education. Bill Sizemore? The, uh the problem with the OEA's position in, in public education is that we're operating in a, a virtual monopoly. And, and nothing in society, in our in economy, have we found that a monopoly produces a good product. If parents have the choice of where they can spend their tax dollars, their education dollars, then the public schools would have to compete, produce a good product, pay good teachers, get rid of bad teachers. But as long as they have a virtual monopoly on education and, and parents have no choice, but to send their kids to a public school regardless of the quality of product they produce, then we're going to continue to see public education decline. Bill Sizemore, are you talking about vouchers? I'm talking about vouchers where parents have the right to choose where their kids are educated. Okay, the voucher system, the voucher system, they just defeated that down in California, the voucher system. Who wants to talk about the voucher system? You, ma'am? Yes, my name is Joan Yadman, and I'm superintendent of the tiny rural school district. Uh, vouchers would just about kill us financially, and I think we're doing an excellent job with, with education. But the truth is, if you take a child away and take $2,500 away from a school, you can't fire 20, 125th of a teacher or turn back in your textbooks or your, your desks. Your expenses are the same. You have to run a school, and right now, with the financial situation that we have in Oregon, we can barely run the public schools with what we have. Voucher system. Who wants to comment on that? You, sir, up in the back? Yes, okay. This is, this is the, um, the amazing kind of discussion we have here about vouchers. This is the only, apparently the only operation in the entire United States where you, ha where you cannot deal with a variable number of customers. The problem you have here is, is that, or, or at least uh, my understanding of it, and uh, our, our education meaning the contrary, is the single greatest factor in the success of the achievement of, of children is the involvement of parents. And that voucher, yeah, the, that voucher is fundamental to having the, the parent involved with the education of, the, of, the, of, the, of their children. And because of that, it's the one tool that you can use to help control a system that is out of control right now. Other side, you, sir. Uh, now, we've seen in the past 13 years a 27% increase in the cost that we paid out per pupil with quality going down. And uh, what are we getting for this? Uh, we've got home students who have every year to get 100% passing on their quality tests. What do the uh, public schools uh, handle? Could they get 100% of their students to pass those same uh, metrics? Uh, it's a good question. Norma Paulus, what's wrong with the well, voucher system? If I, as a parent, why shouldn't I have the choice to get some money from the state and say, okay, I'm going to use it for a public, private school, or whatever? As a parent, as a legislator, as a, a public official, and now superintendent of public instruction, I oppose that, always have, for several reasons. But before I say that, I want to make it clear that the new school reform effort, we envision maximum choice inside the public school system. And still partnership, a monopoly, still a monopoly, but then. 
if you get, we're not talking about choice here. What we're talking about is tax credits for religious schools. We, and it, there is no way that you could sustain, Where's that money you could sustain from? the public school system with a voucher system as is envisioned or was envisioned by California. Rather than, Jeff? We're talking about the public school system, not education of students. We aren't interested in a system as much as we are the results right. of students. This, this lady right here, if we can get a microphone over here, she's had her hand up uh, for a while. Go ahead, scoot, scoot on in there. And, uh, your name? My name is Mary Chafin, and I have two children in the public schools. I have two children in the Japanese Magnet Program. It's a public elementary program where they are schooled half the day in Japanese and half the day in English. And I just want to say that the real issue is making sure that we have a public school system that is adequately funded and is going to bring us into the 21st century. And we have a program right now at, Jap at the Japanese Magnet uh, Program that is a model for that kind of thing. And, and the thing that we're dying for is funding. We have to have stable funding. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. Quality education. Let's get some other These ideas. Other options are fine for, for people, but we have to have a public system. Okay. Nothing uh, else will do. Quality education. Let me get uh, another familiar face here. Mary uh, Wendy Roberts. Uh, quality education. What is a quality education? What makes a quality education? Well, I'd like to speak from my perspective as the Commissioner of Labor and Industries for the state of Oregon. And we've been very involved in what I think is a very exciting thing. And uh, Norm and I have both been involved, and that is the educational reform and the educational innovations that we're that we're doing right now, and that is a way of, of uh, finding uh, the true, I think, uh, quality education, that which prepares young people for the real world, not only as uh, advanced learners, but as also as people who can go in the workplace and earn a living and can be have the skills necessary for the future. And to do that, they must be linked with uh, educational opportunities in the future and we want to expose them to a variety of pathways and the public school system is where that is beginning to happen and I, I would suggest that that we need to sustain that effort right now and 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 show that you can get individualized uh, future planning through that uh, the array that is now being developed in the public school system. Okay, now I heard some people up here saying, oh no, 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 and we'll get to that in just a minute. We got to take a break because when we come back deciding what is best for our kids? We heard a lot of interesting ideas on what a quality education is. What is best for our kids? And uh, Jack Bearworth, you have some children? Yep, three. Three kids. And uh, I'm going to ask you a question. How would you choose what's best for your kids a few years from now if you see public education on the decline? I'm going to ask you that question when we come back. Stay with us, everybody. Fine. <laughs> You hear a lot of noise these days about who's got the biggest pizza. Well, how many square feet of bad pizza do you really want? Enough already! Papa Aldo's uses the highest quality ingredients. Pizza dough made fresh every day. Almost a pound of 100% real cheese and lots of the freshest toppings. It's pizza that tastes great for a great price. Papa Aldo's large pepperoni pizza with a free 2-liter Coke product, now just $6.99. Papa Aldo's Pizza. We make it, you bake it. It's fast and always fresh. If what you look for in a supermarket is selection and variety, then you're going to love IGA. You see, as independent, locally owned stores, we all feel a strong commitment to get you the widest selection of national brands and regional products, plus our own IGA brand, the smart choice for quality and value. And what does this mean for you? It means you'll see a better selection and variety every time you shop at IGA. We offer people a view of the Oregon coast that they couldn't get anywhere else. We have 69 people who work here, and a lot of what they do is behind the scenes. We count on our people to come to work every workday. That's the reason we chose Safe Corporation for our workers' comp insurance. They have innovative programs for early return to work and loss prevention. That's made them very valuable to us. We're a unique facility, and we needed an equally unique workers' comp carrier. It's been a natural partnership. On the job, that's safe. On the next AM Northwest. You thought doctors didn't make house calls, but we'll be bringing one right into your living room. I'm Mary Starrett. I'm Jim Bosley. A pediatrician and a parenting expert will answer your questions about childhood illnesses and behavior problems. Plus health and fitness tips with Victoria Johnson. On AM Northwest, Portland's only live local morning talk show, Monday at 9 on KETU Channel 2. Welcome back to Town Hall, everybody. I posed this question to Jack Beerworth before the break. Take off your uh, school administrator hat for a minute. You're a parent. You have three kids. I'm a parent first. 
How do you choose what's best for your kids? Well, it's interesting. If you this say school the public school districts no, were let me on just, the Let me just say something. This was the one major urban school district in the United States that I could become superintendent of and send my kids to the public schools and feel comfortable about it. Every other, every other major city in the United States is filled with kids who are uh, filled with families who are rich, poor, and don't have kids. I'm worried because not only does that dream go for me as a superintendent, but it goes as a, as a father if we trash the Portland Public Schools along with the rest of public education in the state. What? I will not sacrifice my kids for my career. Good for you. All right. I want to hear, uh, we only have about two minutes left. I want to hear from the pr professor of education. Some advice you could give parents watching at home right now. How do we choose what's best for our kids? What, what things should be going in our mind when we're looking at this whole issue? Should we be afraid of public schools if we hear that maybe education is going to be on the decline? If we believe that education is on the decline and we're afraid of public schools, then they will decline because there'll be no initiative to, to build them up and to keep them, to keep them adequate. I think vouchers, in my opinion, are a cop-out. Vouchers are a cop-out because people like Jack or myself can afford to use a voucher because we're relatively educated people. We know how to, to maneuver the system. A person with no, little Mr. income Danola? may not have that kind Mr. of information. Mr. Mr. Let, I just, let, yes, go, I think go ahead. the major assumption of this discussion is that public schools have always been here since the beginning of time. And I think we have to remember history that they did not exist in full force until really the 1900s, early 1900s. And a comment was made earlier that our country was basically nothing and the power of our country came with public schools. What we have to think about here is that this is an issue of family, privacy, and parental rights and governing and making decisions for their children. It's not an issue of homeschooling against public school against private school. It's what the families do. And as, and as a... That's, <clears throat> and that's where the, one of the major issues is dealing with is dealing with the family and the parents. Whether you're a, a secular person or a religious person, you need to consider your choice and your responsibility to your child. Let's that's the important thing. Quality education. We've got to we've got to hold up right here. But one thing I want to say because we just only have 30 seconds left. This gentleman right here, we're talking about kids. What was it you wanted to say? I wanted to say that I really love school and I wanted to have the best education that it can get. Okay. No matter. <laughs> And you know what? Everyone in this room, we all disagree. A lot of folks disagree on what's right, what's wrong, the best way, but we all want a quality education. All I can tell parents, get involved in your schools, no matter if it's private, home, or public. Take care, everyone. We'll see you next week on Town Hall. Is Rush right or dangerous? Followers and critics of Rush Limbaugh square off next week on Town Hall.